The world's largest active volcano, Mauna Loa, is erupting for the first time in nearly four decades. While there's no major threat to residents on Hawaii's Big Island right now, officials are urging everyone to review their emergency evacuation plans. The direction of the lava flow can quickly change, potentially putting entire communities at risk. Emotions ran high inside a Buffalo court today. The gunman accused of killing 10 people at a supermarket simply because they were black, pleaded guilty to murder, attempted murder, and domestic terrorism motivated by hate. The judge read the names of each victim one by one. Many families of the victims were in tears hearing how each one died. Overseas tonight, the unprecedented nationwide protests in China. Residents there are furious over the extended COVID lockdowns and the government's zero COVID policy. How a blank piece of paper is becoming the symbol of an entire movement and what could be coming next. Tonight, we're tracking a new coast-to-coast -coast storm. At least 18 states now on alert for heavy snow and high winds. And then there's the prospect of tornadoes in parts of the country. Rob Marciano will time it all out. Tonight, the nation's largest Native American tribe is demanding the U.S. government keep a promise it made nearly 200 years ago to give them a voice in Congress. This is a story about a promise, and it's been 187 years, and it's still not fulfilled. Absolutely, and, and, and now is the time to do it. And inside the complex world of marriage and failed marriage, what happens once it ends and how you move forward. Actor Jesse Eisenberg has more on the emotional roller coaster ride that's the subject of his newest TV series. It seems like, you know, he's a guy who's, you know, everything is falling on and he's struggling to maintain, you know, his sanity. But the writer so cleverly shifts your perspective so that, you know, your allegiance starts shifting between my wife, ex-wife, and me. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Some unusual activity in Hawaii tonight. The world's largest active volcano is erupting for the first time in nearly four decades, and the roughly 200,000 residents of Hawaii's Big Island are being warned to stay alert. Mauna Loa began erupting overnight, and dramatic video captured the glowing lava. You see it there. Ash also spewing out of the volcano today. Mauna Loa is so big, in fact, it takes up more than half of the island. The population on the Big Island has roughly doubled since the last eruption and many of those living there now were not around 38 years ago. Tonight residents are being warned to be ready in case the lava or debris start to threaten communities and portions of the Big Island were under an ash advisory today. One big question as we start the week is what impact this will all have on tourism. Southwest Airlines has already moved to cancel several flights today as volcanic ash can pose major problems for airplanes. We have the governor of Hawaii standing by to talk with us but first our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, leads us off. Tonight, new helicopter video capturing Mauna Loa's fiery awakening, erupting for the first time in 38 years. The world's largest active volcano roaring back to life after its longest dormant period on record. You can clearly see that that's lava coming down Mauna Loa. It is nuts. Thermal cameras showing the moment it erupted, spewing volcanic gas into the sky and sending lava gushing out from the summit crater. Time-lapse video also capturing the blast of ash, debris, and molten rock. Lava streams are flowing down part of the volcano, but authorities say they are not threatening communities directly. But there is concern over falling ash. People with respiratory illnesses warned to stay indoors, and anyone going outside told to wear a mask. Shelters being opened as a precaution. You know, we're way overdue. We were way overdue for a Loa eruption, um, and so, we had prepared. Southwest Airlines now canceling several flights to and from the Big Island. Mauna Loa makes up most of the Big Island of Hawaii, and 50 miles down from its summit, it connects with Hawaii's other main volcano, Kilauea. Kilauea's eruption in 2018 destroyed about 700 homes, as we saw firsthand back then. You can see all that lava fountaining here. Now, this is uh, Fisher 17. Some of the fountaining has gone hundreds of feet in the air. What you're seeing over there and those roars are steam and gas flying out of these vents. That stuff is 2,000 degrees. Authorities say lava from today's eruption is contained to the summit area, but alerted communities at potential risk to review their evacuation procedures. 
Lindsay, volcanologists say there's a bit of good news. First, they know the personality of this volcano after dozens of eruptions over the past 140 years or so. And they say typically the heaviest eruptions are in the first few hours after that it tapers off. Also, the fact that these eruptions are happening in the northeast, that means it would take weeks of continuous gushing of lava for it to actually reach populated areas or infrastructure. They say the one thing they can't predict is how long this will last. Lindsay. So unpredictable. Matt, our thanks to you. And joining us now for more is the governor of Hawaii, David Ige. Governor, we thank you so much for your time tonight. Uh, Mauna Loa is so large, and we talked about this at the top of the show, that it takes off more than half of the big island. I'm just curious here on a scale from 1 to 10, how concerned would you say that you are about the eruption happening right now? I think right now we're not um, that concerned. I would say it's about a three. Okay. Um, as you had noted, the uh, eruptions and the fissures uh, are very high up Mauna Loa in a very um, poor, sparsely populated area. In fact, there really is no uh, communities or no, no structures uh, anywhere close to the fissures that are erupting right now. Are you concerned that, as we just heard from Matt there, we don't know how long it could last? So I'm wondering about uh, the idea that the lava could eventually threaten populated areas around Hilo, or are they so far away that that's not even uh, really top of mind? Yeah, I mean, I do think um, that, and we've asked all of our residents to review the um, um, volcano um, preparedness plans, um, and it will definitely be uh, weeks uh, before it would be moving into any um, populated areas. Uh, and so certainly uh, we are encouraging residents to uh, stay posted and keep posted on the current status of the eruption. Um, and certainly I just would want to let our visitors know if you have um, planned a vacation or a trip to Hawaii Island, uh, this eruption is no reason to change your plans. Uh, the eruption is occurring in a very isolated um, part of um, Hawaii Island and it is uh, very far away uh, from any uh, resort or any areas that a visitor might be going to. Well, that's certainly good uh, news and information for, for potential tourists to have. Uh, we have seen some flight disruptions, at least today. Is that something that you think will continue to happen? Well, we certainly are keeping our, our the airlines um, posted on the activity. Um, the air quality um, is still very, very high. There's no... There's not a whole lot of ash um, that is spewing from the volcano at this point in time. Um, certainly, we are um, informing those with respiratory um, illness to be um, take precaution. You know, wear a mask if you are in uh, on the Hawaii island, um, and certainly. Um, they should stay away from the eruption sites and the, the fissures that are spewing lava. Now, the last time that Mauna Loa erupted was nearly 40 years ago. I'm sure you were a, just a young man at that time, but, but curious if you have memories of that and, and what you might be able to learn from the last time that this uh, erupted. I actually um, did a visit, and that was one of the few times that we actually had Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea uh, erupting at the same time. Um, you could actually see the Mauna Loa eruption uh, making its way down um, the slopes. Um, as, as has been mentioned, it will take um, um, weeks, if not longer, of eruptions con uh, occurring in order uh, for the northeast uh, rift zone uh, eruption to reach uh, any kind of community or get close to any infrastructure. Well, that's certainly uh, good to know. And we thank you really so much for joining us tonight, Governor David Ige of Hawaii. Appreciate your time. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha. We turn out to Buffalo, New York, where the gunman accused of killing 10 people at a top supermarket because they were black. He has now pleaded guilty to murder, attempted murder, and to domestic terrorism motivated by hate. I'll speak with a member of one of the victim's families in a moment. But first, here's ABC's Stephanie Ramos in Buffalo tonight. 
Tonight, six months after 10 black people were killed in a racially motivated attack at a Buffalo, New York supermarket, the gunman pleading guilty. And that is what we got today, which was swift justice. The state's indictment against Peyton Gendron includes first-degree murder, attempted murder, and domestic terrorism motivated by hate, which carries a mandatory life sentence. In the courtroom, Gendron replying yes and guilty as the judge named each victim and charge. The then 18-year-old was armed with an illegally modified semi-automatic rifle back in May when he drove more than three hours from his home to target the predominantly black neighborhood. Opening fire in the parking lot of the Tops supermarket, then entering the store. Dendron live streaming the carnage from a camera mounted on his helmet. This defendant's own helmeted mounted video camera, it establishes beyond all doubt the gruesome facts of the defendant's conduct. Prosecutors say he deliberately planned his attack over several months, even visiting the supermarket twice, and posted a document online shortly before the massacre outlining how he planned to kill as many black people as possible. Our thoughts certainly go out to all of those families. Stephanie joins us now from Buffalo. And Stephanie, the shooter still faces federal charges additionally, correct? That is right, Lindsay. The shooter still faces more than two dozen federal charges, some of which carry the possibility of the death penalty. And tonight, Lindsay, we're learning from his parents. They put out a statement saying that their hearts are broken over the devastation that their son has caused. Lindsay. All right, Stephanie Ramos, our thanks to you. Joining us now is Garnell Whitfield Jr. As we just heard in Stephanie's report, his mother, Ruth Whitfield, was among those murdered at the top supermarket. Garnell, we thank you so much for talking with us. It's been just over six months since the attack. First, I'd just like to start by asking how you're doing. Um, I've been better. This was a very difficult day. Of course, uh, you were in court today. Yeah. Uh, describe that experience for us. Um, well, I mean, it was... Uh... It was surreal being in the courtroom with the person that uh, murdered my mom, um, as well as the other nine victims. Uh, it was uh, not something that I looked forward to, and uh, I didn't know how I would feel, but uh, um, it, it was much tougher than I thought it would be. Peyton Gendron was described as having a slight smirk on his face as he walked into the court. He'll, of course, be sentenced in February and faces life in prison. What does justice look like for you? Is is there such a thing in this case? Um, I thank you for asking that question. And and uh, and for me, no, there, there is no such thing as justice. Um, whatever happens to uh, this person um, um, is not going to bring my mother back. It's not going to... Uh, repair the damage that he's done to our family. Um, it's not going to repair our community. And so uh, whatever happens to him is inconsequential at this point for me. Um, my concern is, you know, how, how, do we, how do we mitigate the things that uh, led to this shooting? How do, we, how do we deal with the trauma uh, that envelops our community and that we've lived with uh, uh, since the beginning of this country? Um, those are the things that I'm concerned about. And if I was going to identify what justice looks like to me, it would be uh, to deal with all of the things that have segregated and under-resourced and discriminated against our communities and our people uh, since this country was, was birthed. I imagine this was your first time ever seeing the shooter since May? Um, yeah. I mean, I think I may have seen him once. Again, I've not made him my focus. I've, I, I feel no need to see him. Um, again, he's only a pawn in this. Um, I'm more concerned with the systems and all the other things that uh, allowed him to exist that radicalized him in the first place and supported him in his efforts. Um, those are the things that I, I'm trying to focus on. Uh, the district attorney detailed how Gendron specifically targeted the top store with the aim of killing black people and how he surveilled the store to hit it at the busiest time. What was going through your mind as, as you listened to those particular details? Well, again, um, it's because of that community being segregated, because of it being a food desert, all of those things uh, this, this guy knew. He understood that. He did his homework. 
he understood that it was a segregated community, it was a poor community, that it was the only store in that community and that it would have, uh, uh, you know, a certain amount of people, certain number of people in there at all times because they had no options. Um, and so uh, if he knew that, how could we not know that also? And uh, nothing has changed in terms of that. It is still a vulnerable. That population is still segregated. Um, and all of those conditions still exist today. And so uh, what we have to do is to work to mitigate those issues. And in addition to the segregation, I know that this summer you testified before Congress calling for action to stem gun violence in this country. What would you like to see lawmakers in particular do? Well, I do their jobs. I mean, their jobs are, are to support us. Uh, to protect us uh, and to and to and to you know speak truth to power, and uh, you know uh, not take money from gun lobbies and all the other persons that and entities that they get money from and hold their interests above the people's interests. Um, I want them to do what's right uh, to make sure that we are safe. Uh, that we have uh, equitable op and equal opportunities in this country, that we're treated as human beings and that we're valued. Uh, I want them to, you know, to, uh, to uh, call out white supremacy. I want them to uh, treat it like the cancer that it is. Um, that's what I want them to do. Garnell Whitfield, Jr., we thank you so much for speaking with us. Really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. We turn overseas now to China, where mass protests continue against the country's severe COVID policies that have remained in place nearly three years now into the pandemic. With neighborhoods and businesses continually placed on lockdown, the disruptions have affected markets around the world, including right here in the U.S. Here's ABC's chief global affairs uh, anchor, Martha Raddatz. Tonight, acts of defiance not seen in a generation. Massive protests spreading across China, the largest since Tiananmen Square. Oh. Thousands of people risking their own safety, oh. marching in the streets of Shanghai oh. and the capital, Beijing, outraged over President Xi's extreme zero COVID lockdowns, some calling for his resignation. Oh. Demonstrators holding up those blank pieces of white paper, now a symbol of the movement, saying it represents everything they want to say but cannot. The protests erupting after this fire in the western city of Urumqi, killing 10 people, many blaming the government's strict COVID measures for the delayed response. Despite the lockdowns, COVID cases still surging in China, more than 25,000 new infections every day. Tonight, the White House not condemning China's crackdown, but saying in a statement it supports the right to peacefully protest and acknowledging the ongoing lockdowns could impact the global economic recovery. Clearly, China as a major economic player and China still uh, struggling with uh, COVID, there's obviously there's an impact on the economy. Martha Raddatz joins us now. And Martha, we heard the White House there weighing in on the impact of the global economy, uh, which we saw reflected certainly in the U.S. stock market today. So what are Chinese officials doing as far as whether they should continue these lockdowns? Well, Lindsay, you did see the Dow plunge about 500 points today over fears about the impact on China's own economic recovery and these broader concerns about the supply chain. But, Lindsay, some cities like Beijing announced an easing of some very minor COVID rules. But across the board, these zero COVID lockdowns are not going away anytime soon. Lindsay. All right, Martha Raddatz, our thanks to you as always. Former President Trump remained under fire tonight for having dinner at Mar-a-Lago with the rapper formerly known as Kanye West and a Holocaust-denying white nationalist. So how are Republican leaders reacting? Here's ABC's chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. Nearly a week after dining at Mar-a-Lago with Kanye West and notorious white supremacist Nick Fuentes, Donald Trump has yet to condemn the hateful views of either man. Their views are widely known. West recently said, quote, I'm going to death con three on Jewish people. 
And Fuentes, who took part in the racist protest in Charlottesville in 2017, denies and even mocks the Holocaust, sharing his hateful rhetoric on his online program. We need to uh, have something like a white uprising. In a series of statements since the dinner, Trump said West asked to meet with him and that it was West who brought along Fuentes. As for the dinner, Trump suggested he enjoyed it and explained why he invited West in the first place. We got along great. He expressed no anti-Semitism, and I appreciated all the nice things he said about me on Tucker Carlson. Why wouldn't I agree to meet? Also, I didn't know Nick Fuentes. Three of the people at the dinner said Trump took a liking to Fuentes, one of them telling ABC that Trump said of the white supremacist, quote, he gets me. Kanye West, in a video he posted on Twitter and since deleted, said Trump likes Fuentes because he is more loyal to him than his own lawyers. So Trump is really impressed with Nick Fuentes. If Trump didn't know Fuentes before the dinner, he does now. But neither the former president nor any of his spokespeople have condemned the man's virulently racist views or West's anti-Semitism. Former Vice President Mike Pence called on Trump to apologize. President Trump was wrong uh, uh, to give a, a white nationalist, um, um, an anti-Semite and a Holocaust denier a seat at the table. And uh, I think he should apologize for it. Pence urging Trump to say he's sorry about this. Jonathan Carl joins us now. John, how are Republican leaders in Washington reacting to Trump's dinner guests? Lindsay, we have reached out to both Kevin McCarthy and Mitch McConnell, the two top Republicans in Congress, for comment on all of this. Neither of them responded to us. Uh, Ronna McDaniel, the head of the Republican National Committee, did put out a statement saying, quote, white supremacy, neo-Nazism, hate speech and bigotry are disgusting and do not have a home in the Republican Party. But McDaniel in her statement made no mention of Donald Trump or the fact that people with those views did find a home at Mar-a-Lago over dinner with the former president. Lindsay. Right, at his actual home, which is interesting there. Jonathan at his Carl, actual home, yes. Our, our thanks to you as always. Next to the cross-country storm headed east tonight, at least 18 states are under alert for heavy snow or rain. The snow piling up in the northwest, a convoy of plows keeping a key mountain pass open in Washington, and millions in the south are bracing for severe weather and a possible tornado outbreak. Let's get right to senior meteorologist Rob Marciano, who's in Memphis for us tonight. Hey, Rob. Hi, Lindsay. This system really has uh, two distinct areas of energy that are really going to converge here in the southeast tomorrow. It's going to make for a very dangerous day. Show you what it's doing now. You saw some of the pictures of the snow in the in the mountains of the Cascades, but wind advisories are up for Southern California and in the southwest. That's the southern part of this system. The northern part, we've got uh, winter storm warnings that are posted from Utah to the UP of Michigan uh, tomorrow. So a, a wide reach with this system as it evolves out of the Rockies tomorrow will drag a foot plus of snow in through the higher elevations and then Denver up through north of Omaha Sioux City and through Minneapolis could see 48 inches, maybe as much as 12 inches of snow during the day tomorrow. But in the warm sector here, we're looking for storms to pop in the morning in Louisiana and evolve as they cross the Mississippi into supercell uh, thunderstorms, which can produce long track damaging tornadoes. Mississippi, Alabama, in through Tennessee, and then it pushes towards Georgia during the overnight hours. That's when it gets a little weaker. I mean, it's not going to be it's not going to be a picnic, but it's going to be a little bit weaker. Gets into the northeast Wednesday afternoon, where wind and rain. We could see some damaging winds in the northeast, but certainly the most dynamic weather and most life-threatening weather is going to be in this area tomorrow, from Memphis to just north of Jackson. Large tornadoes and potentially a large hail and damaging winds as well. Folks here, Lindsay, are told to have a plan for tomorrow and to be ready for what, what Mother Nature brings. Meanwhile, I do want to point out this spectacular view. We're high atop the pyramid here in Memphis uh, at the Bass Pro Shops, and it's like the calm before the storm. It's a spectacular city that, uh, right now. Tomorrow is going to be a whole different story. Right. I was going to say calm before the storm is right. A beautiful shot there. We'll see what happens tomorrow. Rob, our thanks to you. You got it.
And when we come back, the remarkable rescue following a small plane crash that left an aircraft tangled in live power lines. News tonight about whether or not the five officers involved in an incident that left a man paralyzed after their police van stopped abruptly will face charges. But up next, the broken promise made by our government more than 200 years ago that forced our nation's largest Native American tribe off their lands and onto the infamous Trail of Tears. What Cherokee leaders are now doing to force Congress to keep its end of the deal that they broke years ago and what that deal was. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's Bring how you start your, your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Basically, my job is one of the cooler jobs we have here on the team. I get to feed everybody today. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners. And the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Yeah, take a look at this scene from a remarkable rescue following a small plane crash in Gaithersburg, Maryland. The plane was tangled in live power lines. The pilot and passenger were trapped inside for hours, dangling about 100 feet above the ground before eventually being rescued. The crash knocked out power to about 85,000 customers. As Congress races to wrap up business for the year, the nation's largest Native American tribe tonight is ramping up calls on the U.S. government to keep a promise that was made nearly 200 years ago. The same treaty which forced the Cherokee people off their lands and onto the infamous Trail of Tears was also supposed to give them official representation in Washington. That has never happened. And now the tribe's chief and would-be delegate says the time has come for Congress to keep up its end of the deal. Our Devin Dwyer reports on just what's at stake. I feel like I'm in a full circle moment here because I'm representing the treaty right that they died for. Kim Teehee and Cherokee Nation Chief Chuck Hoskin are defending a deal their ancestors made with the U.S. government nearly two centuries ago. This is, Mr. Chairman, an historic day for the Cherokee Nation and an historic day for the United States. Millions of Cherokee citizens who have waited for this day to come 
since 1835. It was in 1835 that the Cherokee signed a treaty with the Jackson administration, forced off their ancestral lands in the southeast and onto the infamous Trail of Tears, when 16,000 members of the tribe trekked to Oklahoma and a quarter of them, 4,000 people, died along the way. To seat the delegate would give some small measure of justice uh, to those who lost their lives. A Cherokee delegate to Congress was an explicit part of the Treaty of New Echota. The agreement stating the Cherokee Nation shall be entitled to a delegate in the House of Representatives of the United States whenever Congress shall make provision for the same. How clear cut is the Cherokee right to a congressional delegate? I think compared to especially the rights that other tribes have, the Cherokee one is pretty clear. For generations, the promised position was overlooked and unfilled. But in 2019, the tribe named Tihi, a former Obama administration advisor, to be its delegate. And Hoskin began a campaign to get her seated. I think about my grandfather a lot in this job. He would be amazed that we live in a time now in which his grandson is chief and he can walk into the Congress and be poised with the people behind me to get this done with Kim Teehee. A seat for the Cherokee has resounding bipartisan support. The top Republican on the House Rules Committee is himself Native American. I'm glad to see tribes advocating for their treaties with such conviction. Representation truly does matter. I want to thank you for your patience. That should be a, a massive understatement. If it were up to me, um, you know, I would uh, seat Delegate T tomorrow. So what's standing in the way? Are we as society ready to take seriously the obligations that we owe to tribes. One legal sticking point, the perception Cherokee Americans could effectively get a super vote in Congress, represented by their delegate and the congressperson from their district. It's uncomfortable for non-Indians to think about the possibility of Cherokees having an extra say, but it was also uncomfortable for the Cherokees to be forced out of Georgia. There's also the question of whether a new position needs a new vote and a signature by the president. Who decides? Who's the legal umpire on this one? The courts, which I think without question would be asked to weigh in on this. Keep in mind, nearly 200 years ago, it was already ratified by the Senate and signed by the president of the United States. So it is already the supreme law of land. No more is it just okay to give us a hearing? Teehee says as Cherokee delegate, she would not get to vote on any final legislation, much like the role of the delegate from Washington, D.C. In many ways, my office parallels the offices of every other member of Congress. It's that final vote on the House floor I don't have. Eleanor Holmes Norton is one of six non-voting delegates in Congress, representing the Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, American Samoa, Guam, and the Northern Mariana Islands. They're able to sit on committees, introduce legislation, and give speeches on the House floor, giving voice to their people in the process. And that's why we've had nearly unanimous support throughout the country uh, from, from other Indian tribes expressing support for us. But in addition to that, uh, it'd be an opportunity for us to continue to educate uh, our, my fellow colleagues about the issues that pertain to us. When this House of Representatives seats Kim Teehee... Chief Hoskin is optimistic the Cherokee Nation is on the verge of making history. I really don't see one party standing in the way. But he concedes progress in Congress is often unpredictable and painfully slow. It sounds like a lot of lip service. Everybody's all for it and then nothing ever happens. Well, you, you know, if you're a tribal leader and you know your history, you understand the value of patience. But I also understand that we're talking about the Congress of the United States, a, a, a institution in which Cherokees have often not only struck out, but have been on the receiving end of a great deal of injury. In a statement, outgoing House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said the Cherokee are entitled to representation and that Democrats will continue to explore a path forward. Republican leader Kevin McCarthy did not respond to a request for comment about seating a delegate in the new Congress. Neither side ready to pledge that it will get done. This is a story about a promise, and it's been 187 years, and it's still not fulfilled. Absolutely, and, and, and now is the time to do it. I think most Americans, if they think about what makes the country great, being a country that keeps its word is, is one of those thoughts, and this is a great opportunity for the country to keep its word. Our thanks to Devin Dwyer for that. Still ahead here on Prime, jury selection begins in the high-profile case of a Tatiana Jefferson, the woman who was killed inside her home by a Fort Worth police officer. Our conversation with actor Jesse Eisenberg, who has a new project on Hulu that you'll want to know about. And holiday sales are up 
is that a good thing? We take a look by the numbers, but first our tweet of the day, Miriam is out with its 2022 word of the year, and we couldn't agree more, gaslighting. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. It's lunchtime in America. So what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You got me feeling like your health, your money, breaking news, exclusives, pop culture, and with the biggest stars, music, trends, style, and some laughs and some good food. You got me feeling like... You know, that sounds pretty good. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons, for everything you need to know. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay. He's like the Justin Bieber of the music. <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Cut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back, everyone. Online Black Friday sales hit an all-time high, kicking off a solid start to the holiday shopping season, despite inflation and other economic concerns. Here's a look at how much we've spent by the numbers. $9.12 billion, that's how much online shoppers spent on Black Friday. That is a record and up more than 2% from last year, according to Adobe Analytics, which tracks sales on retailers' websites. Online sales for electronics spiked 221% on Friday compared to an average day in October. Other top draws were toys and exercise equipment. Bargain hunting shoppers bought 12% more per order than usual. And today, Cyber Monday, another $11 billion in online sales. That's in the forecast. Adobe expects nearly $35 billion will be spent online between Thanksgiving and today. And these numbers do not even include the 67% of Black Friday shoppers the National Retail Federation says hit the stores in person. Record spend even as 60% of Americans say the economy is impacting their holiday spending plans, possibly related to the economic worries. A 78% spike in buy now, pay later orders compared to the previous week. Analysts say those economic concerns have retailers racing more than ever to rack up sales and clear out inventory this holiday shopping season. And we still have lots more to get to here on Prime tonight. A catfish case gets deadly. How why online allegedly led to the murders of a family and the kidnapping of a teenage girl. The latest major black mark in the crypto world with another major brand filing for bankruptcy. And we'll meet the barrier-breaking family at the top of the rodeo world. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. much happening these days it's hard to keep up things change hour by hour minute by minute 
the historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. It's lunchtime in America. So, what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You got me feeling like your health, your money, breaking news, exclusives, pop culture, and with the biggest stars, music, trends, style, and some laughs, and some good food. You got me feeling like you know that sounds pretty good. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons, for everything you need to know. You never know what you're gonna get on this show. That's all I'm gonna tell you. Yes, Whoopi! Is this mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely, always. absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right, they don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby! It was crazy. Behind the table, listen wherever you get your podcasts. Basically, my job is one of the cooler jobs we have here on the team. I get to feed everybody today. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. An emotional day at this Buffalo, New York courthouse as Peyton Gendron pled guilty to shooting and killing 10 black people at top supermarket back in May. The 19 year old now facing a mandatory life in prison sentence without the possibility of parole charged with domestic terrorism motivated by hate, murder and attempted murder. Prosecutors say back in May, the shooter traveled several hours from his home to the predominantly black neighborhood in East Buffalo to carry out the massacre on a Saturday Saturday afternoon as innocent people shop for groceries. Officials say the teen wrote 180 pages of racist vitriol, practiced shooting at state parks, and even visited the supermarket twice to canvas the area. Authorities say he also illegally modified his gun. Jury selection has begun in the trial of the former police officer indicted in a Tatiana Jefferson's killing. It comes three years after Jefferson's shooting death in October of 2019 and after multiple delays. Former Fort Worth officer Aaron Dean was responding to a call from Jefferson's neighbor to check on her home, walked into her backyard without identifying himself as police. Jefferson, who was in the house playing video games with her eight-year-old nephew, allegedly heard someone in the backyard, grabbed her gun, after which Dean shouted at her to show her hands before immediately firing into her window a second later killing her Dean was indicted for murder five police officers from New Haven Connecticut have been charged in their treatment of a black man in their custody Richard Cox was arrested for carrying an unlawful firearm when he was placed in a police van the officers did not secure his seatbelt onto him when the van abruptly stopped Cox flew into the side of the van head first in addition the suspect did not receive immediate medical help Five cops are charged with misdemeanor, reckless endangerment, and cruelty to persons by state police. A lawsuit's been filed against those officers and the city of New Haven. More fallout from the collapse of cryptocurrency exchange FTX. A cryptocurrency lender, BlockFi, has now filed for bankruptcy. The Wall Street Journal says as of last year, BlockFi had up to $20 billion worth of deposits. BlockFi has previously said it had significant exposure to FTX and Alameda Research around the time of FTX's bankruptcy filing. The lender had been bailed out by FTX in recent months. 
now becomes the latest crypto lender to file for bankruptcy this year with fellow lenders Celsius Network and Voyager Digital also forced to do so. Investigators in Connecticut are still trying to determine what sparked a massive fire that engulfed several buildings along the historic Mystic Waterfront. The four-alarm fire broke out just before 9 o'clock. Firefighters say there were several propane tanks located near the fire, which exploded as the fire spread. Several buildings collapsed as the wind caused the flames to spread rapidly. It doesn't appear the Mystic Pizza restaurant that inspired the movie was involved. One firefighter was taken to the hospital for smoke inhalation. A Texas woman kidnapped as a toddler has been reunited with her family 51 years later. Melissa Highsmith embraced her parents for the first time in decades after she was identified through a 23andMe DNA test. In 1971, Melissa's mom was working as a waitress in Fort Worth, Texas, placed an ad looking for a babysitter for her toddler daughter. The babysitter picked up Melissa and never returned. Melissa's family had been looking for her ever since. Just this past weekend, the family came together for the very first time it's a miracle <laughs> it's a Christmas miracle Welcome back. A former Virginia state trooper was killed in a shootout with deputies in California. The reason he is accused of driving across country to kidnap a teen, kill her family members, and then burn their home down. ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas has the tragic details. Tonight, authorities are laying out a clearer picture of what led to a triple murder and fire at this family home in Riverside, California. Police say it all began 2,500 miles away with Virginia police officer and former state trooper Austin Lee Edwards, the 28-year-old allegedly posing as someone else and luring a Southern California teenage girl into an online relationship, a scheme known as catfishing. Police suspect Edwards traveled across the country, showing up at the home of the girl's grandparents, killing the couple, Mark and Sherry Winnick, and the girl's mother, Brooke. We had, you know, a grandmother, a grandfather, and a mother of this teen murdered uh, by this suspect who, who travels from across the country um, for most likely would be the sexual exploitation of this teenager. Authorities responding to a call about a distressed girl racing away with a man in a red Kia SUV. A sheriff's chopper tracking the car. Edwards allegedly leading police on a high-speed chase, ending in a shootout with a police SWAT team in the Mojave Desert. The suspect killed, but the teenage girl rescued unharmed. This is just a very uh, a tragic example of how dangerous those interactions can be. Lindsay, police say this is a painful reminder to parents about how they must try to be aware of who their children are communicating with online. Lindsay. Pierre, thank you. Next to the remarkable return of Jay Leno onto the comedy stage just weeks after suffering devastating burns, Juju Cheng has more on his comeback and what the recovery ahead looks like. We got two shows tonight, regular and extra crispy. Okay. Just two weeks after he was seriously burned by a horrific gas fire, Jay Leno returning to the stage. I got burned. I was in a hospital for a few days and now I'm back out working again. The legendary comic performing a sold out show at the Comedy and Magic Club in Hermosa Beach. He was just amazing. It was great. Got a standing ovation before and after. The 72 year old even joking about the accident as part of his set. He made a few small references. Arsenio made some funny, really funny references. Leno back in action just days after this first image of the star following the terrifying gas fire. The former Tonight Show host standing with medical staff at the Grossman Burn Center, where he was treated with hyperbaric oxygen therapy and received skin grafts. The remnants of those second and third degree burns visible on his face, chest, and hands. Leno, a longtime car enthusiast, was working on one of his vintage vehicles when a gas explosion happened earlier this month. Time to get some heat in her now. The former late Late night star revealing that a quick thinking friend most likely saved his life. A mechanic at Leno's garage telling E.T. about the accident. It was a, a steam car that is steam is made by gas and red spray and bitter. Leno's love of collectible cars is clearly evident on his CNBC show, Jay Leno's Garage, where he's hosted prominent guests. I guess you guys want to do this? Let's do it. Come on. Let's All right, Mr. All President. Right. Getting back on the road this weekend, spotted with this vintage Bentley on the streets of L.A. While the comic's injuries were severe, Leno's doctor saying he is pleased with his progress. I don't want to underestimate the seriousness of his injuries, but I think that that positive outlook is something that's going to do well for him.
Glad to see he's back at it. Our thanks to Juju. Inside the complex world of marriage and failed marriage, what happens once a union ends and the new life emerges from the old one? As part of the emotional exploration of the Hulu series, Fleischman is in trouble until the ex-wife of the lead character played by Jesse Eisenberg vanishes and things get even more complicated. It's an adaptation of the 2019 novel of the same name that keeps you guessing. Our Stephanie Ramos sat down with Eisenberg to talk about his starring role in this emotional foray into storytelling. You reached Rachel Fleischman. Toby was forced to ask the question that occurred to him nearly every few minutes since his separation. How did I get here? I did not become a doctor to get rich, okay? I did it to live a meaningful life. Money doesn't buy you happiness. Oh, Toby, of course it does. What, are you crazy? Let's talk about Fleischman in trouble. So okay. why is he in trouble? When the story opens, um, I have just been through like a a horrible divorce and I'm finally kind of like learning to try to accept things and move forward in my life and for the first time in my life I go on these apps and I'm dating and for the first time in my life people like seem to be interested in me. I was with my wife for so long and before that I was like kind of a shy young guy but ultimately the story kind of as it shifts along you realize uh, that something has happened to my wife and that um, the story is not as simple as it seemed. This is a story about everything. It's about life and marriage and how young love <laughs> can become old resentment and jealousy, ambition, career. I don't even have time to get a divorce. That's him. Would you say Toby is the anti-hero in this story? Yeah, I mean, the story is so brilliantly structured to kind of ask the audience for sympathy for Toby. It seems like, you know, he's a guy who's, you know, everything is falling on and he's struggling to maintain, you know, his sanity. But the writer so cleverly shifts your perspective so that, you know, your allegiance starts shifting between my wife, ex-wife, and me. So the show very cleverly spins the kind of idea of male sympathy on its head in a really interesting way. How was it working with Claire? Yeah, I didn't know Claire. You know, but I like, you know, just obviously grew up, you know, idolizing her. She's like the greatest actress in the world since the time I'm young, you know, because she started quite young. So, Ricky, Angel's in love with Jordan Catalano. We have to help her. So it was a bit surreal playing like, you know, I guess when you grow up like watching somebody, you think of them in like in some untouchable way. So it had this kind of surreal quality of being with her and she's so amazing in the show. It seems like Fleshman really takes us into this New York City world that, mm -hmm. uh, Claire Danes' character really wants to be a part of. I have a line where I say, I'm a rich person in every part of this world except the 40 square blocks you insist we live, on, live in. Because she has like these aspirations to, you know, live beyond our means, to have, you know, a fancy luxurious apartment and to, you know, and, and not ever walk anywhere. I want to walk everywhere. And I'm kind of like, you know, a regular guy and she wants to, you know, take cars everywhere. And so we have this kind of as a, you know, as just one of our ongoing arguments. New York's changed a lot and they ended up having to do a lot of digital effects to make it look contemporary, but, you know, six years ago contemporary. The third episode goes back in time to 1996 and takes you through all of our relationship. It's gorgeous because you really see, like, kind of changing New York throughout this episode, shooting inside the 92nd Street. Why everything was so specifically done because it was all made by people who are from here. It was not like the kind of thing where it's this idealized other version of New York. Can I get Instagram? Everyone has it. No, we've answered this before. No social media until you're 13. Everyone. Hannah, you don't even have a phone. It's not good for kids and anxiety. Your brain is still developing, Dad, all right? Don't talk about it. Excuse me. We've already talked about it, okay? How about my anxiety that everybody is always on it and leaving me out? She has a point. Yeah? <laughs> so in the series, we also see Toby navigating parenthood before and after the divorce. You are a father yourself, so did, did that change your approach to this role at all, having kids yourself? You're an animal. I passed by a, the poster of the TV show yesterday while I was trying to get out all of my like kids' stuff, and I just realized, like, the, it just was like this moment of like, wait, I, this is like exactly what the show is. Like, I'm the cliche of the thing, but it's also real. <laughs> You're doing so much. You, your dad, your husband, uh, a director, playwright, author. Oh, yeah. How do you decide what project to take on? I mean, it's it's got to be difficult to 
to juggle it all? I try to do a thousand things because like 900 of them will never happen. You know, it's a career in the arts is like you're lucky if you have any job. So like I just try to stay busy. It's not like I have a normal job. I mean, mm -hmm. every other human being I know goes to like a normal thing where they work every day and I just don't have that. My wife teaches in four schools in New York, so she's, you know, busy every day, you know, but that's like normal. No one, you know, pities that. So my job, it seems like it's, I'm very busy because I'm on posters and it looks like I'm busy, but it's, you have a lot of time off and, you know, you'd that's go good. crazy if you weren't working. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's like predictable unpredictability. Yes, exactly like that. Job. And this will be the last question. What was okay. it, your mo most favorite part of working with this show and the cast and what, what are you taking away from it? I was not sure how to like modulate um, you know my <laughs> emotions because I'm used to feeling like every day is so severe because in movies you know they're kind of a shorter you know it's just a shorter window of a story so I you asked me my favorite thing and I ended up saying something that really stressed me out so I would say this is, sums up my personality really well but once again uh, yeah sorry for yeah turning all these nice things into misery so no, okay. anyway thank you very much <laughs> thank you our thanks to Stephanie Ramos for that. You can stream the first three episodes of Fleischman is in Trouble on Hulu right now. And finally tonight, meet the Jackson family. Five generations of champions, and as Janae Norman shows us, born to rodeo. This rodeo family of seven is honoring the legacy of black cowboys and their own family history, collecting wins across the country. Good. Parents Corey and Robin and their fifth generation cowboy kids, Robert, Nick, Reagan, Ryan, and Dylan, make up the Jackson family rodeo crew. You should be on the outline. After homeschooling with mom, the kids practice daily with dad in preparation for rodeo competitions. Like last weekend's Bull Ride Mania Finals Championship, where 14-year-old Nick won in his division. He was only seven when he got on his first bull, going on to be named the 2020 Junior World Bull Riding Champion at 13 and hoping to win again at this year's World Finals in December. Horses and everything have just flowed throughout our family. And ever since I was little, I've always been interested in rodeo. 12-year-old twins, Reagan and Ryan, and 9-year-old Dylan have made their own marks, barrel racing and bull riding. But for the Jacksons, it's about more than taking home titles. It's a passion. It's a lifestyle. Um, it's just not something that we do. It goes well so far deep deeper than just, you know, the competition. The Jacksons live in Upper Marlboro and on the same land that Robin watched her late father, Robert Harper, develop years ago. On my dad's side, back to the Reconstruction era, um, uh, my family, the men, were sharecroppers. Not until my dad did that skill change into a pleasure activity. I'm so thankful because um, all the decisions that my dad made um, early on, um, we had no idea how that was going to impact our lives today. Though 15-year-old Robert doesn't compete, he's an avid rodeo fan, horse lover, and supporter of his four siblings. Robert actually didn't learn to walk until he was three. And to see him now, I think living on a farm has really helped him in his gross motor skills. He can do anything he wants to do. We can do just about anything as a family. Whatever the activity is, we're able to do it as one unit. Good. Nice story there. Thanks to Janae for that. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. Take a look at this beautiful Christmas tree as pictured in the White House Blue Room. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, residents of one of America's largest cities are still being warned not to drink their tap water. How long will this situation in Houston last? Plus, with a Mexican arrest warrant looking into the death of American tourist Shanquella Robinson filed, how will justice actually be served across borders? We'll explore that question right after the break. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust, and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news.
after an extraordinary newsmaking year. Thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. You never know what you're gonna get on this show. That's all I'm gonna tell you. Yes, Whoopi! Is this mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely, always. absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right, they don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasure that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hello. Tuesday night, come to laugh, <laughs> feel loved, and learn the secrets of one of the most loved Christmas movies. Love actually is... And how did Hugh answer? Oh, dead. <laughs> and relive the dance. Find out why it almost didn't happen and is now all across TikTok. Genius. <laughs> the Diane Sawyer Special, Tuesday at 8, 7 central on ABC. It's lunchtime in America. So, what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You got me feeling like... Your health, your money. Breaking news, exclusives. Pop culture, and with the biggest stars. Music, trends, style. And some laughs. And some good food. You got me feeling like... You know, that sounds pretty good. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons, for everything you need to know. I'm Lindsay Davis, thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. The Cleveland Browns have officially added Deshaun Watson to their roster, according to ESPN. Watson served an 11-game suspension for violating the league's personal conduct policy by committing sexual assault as defined by the NFL on massage therapists. He was also fined $5 million and has had to undergo a mandatory treatment program. Watson has repeatedly denied any wrongdoing. The World Health Organization has renamed monkeypox to MPOC, citing concerns that the original name could be construed as discriminatory and racist. The WHO said it was concerned by the racist and stigmatizing language that arose after the virus spread to more than 100 countries. It said numerous individuals and countries asked the organization to propose a way forward to change the name. Both monkeypox and MPOX would be used for the next year while the old name is phased out. The Houston Independent School District will remain closed through tomorrow due to the boil water notice that put the city on edge. The district announced all employees will be working remotely unless otherwise instructed. The decision comes after a power outage over the weekend impacted a water treatment plant. The mayor of Houston said the incident is being investigated and apologized to the city, school students and parents for the cancellations. We turn now to Buffalo, New York, where the gunman accused of killing 10 people at a top supermarket simply because they were black. He has now pleaded guilty to murder, attempted murder, and to domestic terrorism motivated by hate. ABC Stephanie Ramos is in Buffalo tonight with the details. Tonight, six months after 10 black people were killed in a racially motivated attack at a Buffalo, New York supermarket, the gunman pleading guilty. And that is what we got today, which was swift justice. The state's indictment against Peyton Gendron includes first-degree murder, attempted murder, and domestic terrorism motivated by hate, which carries a mandatory life sentence. In the courtroom, Gendron replying yes and guilty as the judge named each victim and charge. The then 18-year-old was armed with an illegally modified semi-automatic rifle back in May when he drove more than three hours from his home to target the predominantly black neighborhood opening fire in the parking lot of the Topps supermarket, then entering the store. Dendron live streaming the carnage from a camera mounted on his helmet. This defendant's own helmeted mounted video camera, it establishes beyond all doubt the gruesome facts of the defendant's conduct. Prosecutors say he deliberately planned his attack over several months, even visiting the supermarket twice, and posted a document online shortly before the massacre outlining how he planned to kill as many black people as possible. Tonight, his guilty plea, little solace for the families of the victims, including Garnell Whitfield, who lost his 86-year-old mother, Ruth. To hear how she died and to just imagine what she faced in that moment, having lived the life that she lived, um, it's just tough to take. 
Our hearts and thoughts go out to all of those families. Our thanks to Stephanie Ramos. Now to some unusual activity in Hawaii tonight. The world's largest active volcano is erupting for the first time in nearly four decades. And the roughly 200,000 residents of Hawaii's Big Island are being warned to stay alert. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, reports. Tonight, new helicopter video capturing Mauna Loa's fiery awakening, erupting for the first time in 38 years. The world's largest active volcano roaring back to life after its longest dormant period on record. You can clearly see that that's lava coming down Mauna Loa. It is nuts. Thermal camera showing the moment it erupted, spewing volcanic gas into the sky and sending lava gushing out from the summit crater. Time-lapse video also capturing the blast of ash, debris and molten rock. Lava streams are flowing down part of the volcano, but authorities say they are not threatening communities directly. But there is concern over falling ash. People with respiratory illnesses warned to stay indoors and anyone going outside told to wear a mask. Shelters being opened as a precaution. You know, we're way overdue. We were way overdue for a monolithic eruption. Um, and so we had prepared. Southwest Airlines now canceling several flights to and from the Big Island. Mauna Loa makes up most of the Big Island of Hawaii, and 50 miles down from its summit, it connects with Hawaii's other main volcano, Kilauea. Kilauea's eruption in 2018 destroyed about 700 homes, as we saw firsthand back then. You can see all that lava fountaining here. Now, this is uh, Fisher 17. Some of the fountaining has gone hundreds of feet in the air. What you're seeing over there and those roars are steam and gas flying out of these vents. That stuff is 2,000 degrees. Authorities say lava from today's eruption is contained to the summit area, but alerted communities at potential risk to review their evacuation procedures. Our thanks to Matt Gutman. Former President Trump is under fire tonight for having dinner at Mar-a-Lago with the rapper formerly known as Kanye West and a Holocaust-denying white nationalist. So how are Republican leaders reacting? Here's ABC's chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. Nearly a week after dining at Mar-a-Lago with Kanye West and notorious white supremacist Nick Fuentes, Donald Trump has yet to condemn the hateful views of either man. Their views are widely known. West recently said, quote, I'm going to death con three on Jewish people. And Fuentes, who took part in the racist protest in Charlottesville in 2017, denies and even mocks the Holocaust, sharing his hateful rhetoric on his online program. We need to uh, have something like a white uprising. In a series of statements since the dinner, Trump said West asked to meet with him and that it was West who brought along Fuentes. As for the dinner, Trump suggested he enjoyed it and explained why he invited West in the first place. We got along great. He expressed no anti-Semitism, and I appreciated all the nice things he said about me on Tucker Carlson. Why wouldn't I agree to meet? Also, I didn't know Nick Fuentes. Three of the people at the dinner said Trump took a liking to Fuentes, one of them telling ABC that Trump said of the white supremacist, quote, he gets me. Kanye West, in a video he posted on Twitter and since deleted, said Trump likes Fuentes because he is more loyal to him than his own lawyers. So Trump is really impressed with Nick Fuentes. If Trump didn't know Fuentes before the dinner, he does now. But neither the former president nor any of his spokespeople have condemned the man's virulently racist views or West's anti-Semitism. Former Vice President Mike Pence called on Trump to apologize. President Trump was wrong uh, uh, to give a, a white nationalist, um, um, an anti-Semite and a Holocaust denier a seat at the table. And uh, I think he should apologize for it. Pence urging Trump to say he's sorry about this. Jonathan Carl joins us now. John, how are Republican leaders in Washington reacting to Trump's dinner guests? Lindsay, we have reached out to both Kevin McCarthy and Mitch McConnell, the two top Republicans in Congress, for comment on all this. Neither of them responded to us. Uh, Ronna McDaniel, the head of the Republican National Committee, did put out a statement saying, quote, white supremacy, neo-Nazism, hate speech and bigotry are disgusting and do not have a home in the Republican Party. But McDaniel in her statement made no mention of Donald Trump or the fact that people with those views did find a home at Mar-a-Lago over dinner with the former president. Lindsay. Right, at his actual home, which is interesting there. Jonathan at his Carl, actual home, yes. Our, our thanks to you as always. Thank you.
Next to the cross-country storm headed east tonight, at least 18 states are under alert for heavy snow or rain. The snow piling up in the northwest, a convoy of plows keeping a key mountain pass open in Washington, and millions in the south are bracing for severe weather and a possible tornado outbreak. Let's get right to senior meteorologist Rob Marciano, who's in Memphis for us tonight. Hey, Rob. Hi, Lindsay. This system really has uh, two distinct areas of energy that are really going to converge here in the southeast tomorrow. It's going to make for a very dangerous day. Show you what it's doing now. You saw some of the pictures of the snow in the in the mountains of the Cascades, but wind advisories are up for Southern California and in the southwest. That's the southern part of the system. The northern part, we've got uh, winter storm warnings that are posted from Utah to the UP of Michigan uh, tomorrow. So a, a wide reach with this system as it evolves out of the Rockies tomorrow will drag a foot plus of snow in through the higher elevations and then Denver up through north of Omaha through city and through Minneapolis could see 48 inches, maybe as much as 12 inches of snow during the day tomorrow. But in the warm sector here, we're looking for storms to pop in the morning in Louisiana and evolve as they cross the Mississippi into supercell uh, thunderstorms, which can produce long track damaging tornadoes. Mississippi, Alabama, in through Tennessee, and then it pushes towards Georgia during the overnight hours. That's when it gets a little weaker. I mean, it's not going to be it's not going to be a picnic, but it's going to be a little bit weaker. Gets into the northeast Wednesday afternoon, where wind and rain. We could see some damaging winds in the northeast, but certainly the most dynamic weather and most life-threatening weather is going to be in this area tomorrow, from Memphis to just north of Jackson. Large tornadoes and potentially a large hail and damaging winds as well. Folks here, Lindsay, are told to have a plan for tomorrow and to be ready for what Mother Nature brings. Meanwhile, I do want to point out this spectacular view. We're high atop the pyramid here in Memphis uh, at the Bass Pro Shops, and it's like the calm before the storm. It's a spectacular city that, uh, right now. Tomorrow is going to be a whole different story. Right. I was going to say calm before the storm is right. A beautiful shot there. We'll see what happens tomorrow. Rob, our thanks to you. You got it. We turn now to a remarkable rescue following a small plane crash in Gaithersburg, Maryland. The plane was tangled in live power lines with the pilot and passenger trapped inside for hours, dangling about 100 feet above the ground before eventually being rescued. Here's ABC's Gio Benitez. Tonight, this terrifying scene playing out nearly 100 feet in the air. A small single engine plane slamming into a transmission tower Sunday night and then getting stuck amid high tension power lines. I saw like two big flashes. I thought, oh, it's just lightning. On board, the pilot and one passenger on their way from White Plains, New York, to Maryland's Montgomery County Airport, just a mile from the crash site. The pilot's hand seen gripping the window frame of the dangling aircraft. We took very deliberate and time consuming steps to effect the rescue and the uh, removal of those two folks. The crash temporarily shutting down power to nearly 120,000 customers and forcing the state's largest school district to cancel classes today. Rescuers spending over seven hours meticulously working to secure the aircraft and then bring it down. They stabilized the plane by the crane, then segmented the plane and the engine from as two pieces. Lindsay, one person is still in the hospital and the NTSB is investigating to figure out how this happened. They're looking very closely at last night's rain and fog. Lindsay. All right, Gio, thank you. Now to the investigation into the death of an American tourist, Shanquella Robinson in Mexico. An arrest warrant has been issued. And now there are questions about how justice will work across borders. ABC's Matt Rivers has more from Mexico City. Mexican authorities say they believe 25-year-old U.S. citizen Shanquilla Robinson was killed by an acquaintance, another American woman, while on vacation in Los Cabos. Robinson was found dead at a luxury resort in late October, traveling with a group of friends whose actions immediately became suspicious. In one now viral video too violent to show, Robinson is seen being severely beaten by another woman in her hotel room, while at least two people in the room watch or record the incident. In another, someone films Robinson taking a nap the day before she was killed. Buddy, 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 buddy. A police report from the day she died says guests at the resort called for medical help, claiming she had drunk a lot of alcohol. A doctor said she was, quote, stable but dehydrated, adding that the guests refused to bring her to a hospital. The police report said she went into cardiac arrest and was declared dead at 6 p.m. But an autopsy obtained by ABC News contradicted that report saying she was declared dead three hours earlier, suffering from a severe spinal cord injury and a dislocated neck. 
they attacked her and it was nothing she could do. And all she could say is no. She wasn't a fighter, no way. She has a good heart. Mexican authorities now saying the prime suspect in the case back in the United States. The fact that the person accused is an American citizen fundamentally changes all of the evaluation here. Mexican prosecutors filing charges for femicide, which means they believe Robinson was killed at least in part because of her gender. Mexico is asking the U.S. to extradite the suspect to face charges in Mexico. The Department of Justice will have to evaluate any evidence. If the U.S. authorities and potentially U.S. court are not convinced that the Mexicans have a very strong case, that it's very unlikely that she would be extradited. Our thanks to Matt. And still to come, a pair of comedic sisters take a deep dive into discomfort, reliving racist experiences with a bit of humor. I sat down with Lacey Lamar and Amber Ruffin for a candid conversation. Plus, Ghana versus South Korea head to head in a highly anticipated match. Which star player was benched and which team came out on top? The answers coming up next. Stay with us. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Days of turmoil and protests in China over stringent COVID restrictions flared in several cities. Protesters chanted against masks and COVID tests, demanding freedom. The White House also criticized China's COVID containment strategy and argued that people have a right to peacefully protest. Tensions rose when Mexican police dismantled a migrant camp set up on the Mexican side of the border. Officers forced resisting migrants out, facing off against them and pulling tents away. Some tents caught fire with police officers pushing them into the nearby river to douse the flames. An evicted migrant from Venezuela told Reuters he didn't want to leave the camp in front of the border wall as it was a way to put pressure on the U.S. authorities to allow them to enter the country. And in today's World Cup wrap-up, Ghana won over South Korea 3-2 in a high-intensity match. And then Brazil managed to beat Switzerland 1-0 without their star Neymar after an injury has sidelined him. And Portugal cruised to win over Uruguay one to zero. Turning now to the world record book of racist stories. Yes, that is actually the name of the book. Sisters Lacey Lamar and Amber Ruffin recall their memories of racism and what they call 50-50 of silly and scary stories. Amber, who is the comedian and host of the Amber Ruffin Show, is also the first black woman in history to ever write for late night television on Late Night with Seth Meyers. Duo's first book, You'll Never Believe What Happened to Lacey, details all the racist situations that Lacey's been in. Now the sisters dive into their own experiences with racism 
racism and also through the perspectives of family and friends. Days ago, I had a chance to sit down with the two to talk about their book of racist stories. Why a book number two? Why wasn't the first book of racist stories sufficient? <laughs> We had great stories that we wanted to put in the first one and we didn't, and now we're like, let's do it. And I still live in Omaha, Nebraska, and these too many wild, hilarious things were happening to me, and I was like, this, we need another book. Plus, we wanted to add our family and people in the community. Like your friends, your friend, MB, yeah. right? And, and I kind of was struck by this, right? Because you have this part in the book where you talk about how your good friend who's white, you say you guys love to trade opposite stories. Stories where I'm suffering some racist nonsense and she's getting away with everything but murder. Is there a point where you think this isn't funny or are you able to just laugh at the difference? Um, it's almost always funny because I'm not learning anything new. I'm, I, you know, it's the world that I've always lived in. <laughs> now there are words to it. But it's only just a specificity and a large thing that I already know to be true. And that, you know, to me makes it hilarious. Sometimes we're not trying to say this story is funny. Sometimes we're trying to say, look at white privilege and look at, just look at racism in itself, just look at it. It's still happening. Parts of it might be funny, but this stuff is true and it's happening yeah. every day. And another part that, that struck me, you talk about um, a scenario where you're in a store and all of a sudden, you know, the security guard starts following you and you're like, well, nothing unusual there, right? I mean, there's kind of almost an expectation, but then it's like there's six people in the store. This is so ridiculous, it's funny. But is there an underlying sadness? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. I mean, sure. I don't know. I don't feel that way because that's just what it is, right? It, it, you know, I, I'm having trouble thinking of a comparison, but it's like, oh, this is a horrible one. But like, we all get a period. It's horrible. It's horrible. So it's but just it's part of life. Happen. It's, it's just, just a life. rite of passage. Yeah. And that in itself is sad. <laughs> <laughs> See how we laugh. We're terrible. We laugh at everything. We do laugh. We, we do laugh, laugh at everything. And that does, right? Laugh to keep from crying, yep. in a way. Um, and I'm curious, so obviously you live in Omaha, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. You live in New York City. How is racism different and, and the microaggressions and the passes and racism from the Midwest to the East Coast? Here, it's good. <laughs> it's more in your face in Omaha. To the point when it does happen, I think Amber sometimes doesn't even, she's like, did that just happen? I'm like, yep, it happened, let's keep, keep walking. Like, yes. When she goes to visit When she you. comes to visit. And when I'm in ne Nebraska, when I'm in New York, I feel free and I joke with her, I'm like, I'm free! Yeah. <laughs> I'm running down the street, <laughs> I'm in the store, I'm picking this up, no one's staring. I mean, and of course, we're not saying that there's no racism in New York, we're not saying that. But it is a, it is a shift, it is totally different. When I'm walking down the street, when I am I walk into a building, I don't feel that everybody's looking at you. You're the only person. chip in that cookie. Yes. And when you are writing these books, who is your audience? Like our audience is always us or the people most like us. Like when you're writing, like some of the book is, um, hey, look at this stuff. This stuff happens all the time. Can you believe it? Here's a fun way to handle it. I think the audience is always black people. It's because black people need to hear, hey, this has happened to me, and when it happens to you, here's an option. You're not alone. But And I, and I also say that I have had so many white people come up to me and say, I, I read your book, I love it, and oh my God, I do this. And so that's the one little part that I like. Because you dedicate the book to your family and friends and jokingly to all white people, but really it seems that white people are picking up the book, right? Yeah, and, no, they are. And they are black people picking it up because they say, I want to commiserate on this, or because I'm wondering if people are like, I don't need to read about it, I live it every day, I see this, this is my experience. They're like, I love it, that happened to me at work yesterday, this is happening now and maybe I'm gonna say something now. Also, sometimes black people are like, I read this book and frankly, I couldn't believe it. Is it cathartic to actually write about the stories, to write out the experiences? Yeah, it's fun to tell, not fun, oh, lies. Well, I mean, some of the stories are fun to tell, but it's great to tell. It's like, 
I'm getting these out of here. I'm getting them off my chest. I'm putting some people, on, you know, they need to know that this happened and they did that. And it does, it does feel good to tell. You obviously get to write about, you know, Hello. real life and make it funny every day. Do you feel that, that race is something that we get to talk about enough and poke enough fun about with it? I don't know, right? Because I feel like the only way we used to talk about race in, let's say, the 90s was through jokes, and that was it. Wasn't nobody dissecting anything. But then now I think everyone is doing what feels good. Like, us writing down these stories is cathartic. A lot of times when people are using comedy, they're just like, what kind of laughs can I get from what? But I think people are in a, a phase where we are working through our stuff. For the person who has not had the chance to read the book yet, give us like some little snippets of some of these stories. Back when I uh, was looking for a wedding dress for my wedding, we went to this boutique shop, which was like super fancy, in the fanciest place the you can shop in Omaha. fancy shop in Omaha. And I was like, let me see if I can find a beautiful dress for my wedding. We go in there and the lady's like, can I, can I help you? Do you need any, what, well, what, are you, what are you looking for? I go, Lacey's like, oh, well, my sister's getting married. And then she, we don't have wedding dresses. So now we know she doesn't want us in the store. store. So we both take out our little brown hands and we get to touching. Mm -hmm. And we touch every dress. Every, we, every, but she also tells Amber, then she tries to convince Amber not to get married. She goes, and weddings are overrated. <laughs> weddings are overrated. What, 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 he, she tried to unsell us a dress. Amber on Lacey's book, The World Record Book of Racist Stories, is now available wherever books are sold. And still to come, a music and movie icon of the 80s, we remember the life and legacy of Irene Cara. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! Is this mic on? Can you hear me? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the night. <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out! It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. Finally tonight, remembering Irene Cara, whose talent took her from the South Bronx to the height of fame. Her voice inspired a generation. Irene Cara was an 80s sensation with her title track, I'm Gonna Live Forever. From her breakout role as Coco Hernandez in the 1980 musical Fame, to co-write and perform the title song to the hit movie Flashdance. That song, What a Feeling, was a smash success. A Here she is in 1984 at the Oscars, winning for Best Original Song. She also won two Grammys and a Golden Globe for the same song, which is still on Billboard's Top 100 Hot Songs of All Time. Oh, no, no, no. She was born Irene Escalada in New York City, where she began her career as a child star. A regular on the children's show, The Electric Company. 
As a teenager, she played the title role in the 1976 musical Sparkle, about three sisters forming a singing group. She's got a one of love. The movie Fame went on to become a popular TV series for six seasons. One of the show's stars, Debbie Allen, remembered Kara with a tweet saying, My heart is broken. She was a gifted and beautiful genius. And only 63 years old. That's our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. It's lunchtime in America. So what are we serving up? Well, how